But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid of society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of, the, uh, of the United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock, when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, obviously they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously, they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand, and uh, it will be the greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it. 
until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of the more leader. Some, sometimes when I describe all the methods, uh, students ask me a question, are you sure this is the result of the Soviet influence? Not necessarily. You see, the tactic of subversion about which I'm talking is similar to the martial art, the Japanese martial art. If, you're, if some of you are familiar with that tactic, probably you will remember that if an enemy is bigger and heavier than yourself, it would be very painful to resist his direct strike. If a heavier person wants to strike me in the face, it would be very naive and counterproductive to stop his blow. The Chinese and Japanese judo art tells us what to do. First to avoid the strike, then to grab the fist and continue his movement in the direction where it was before, right? Until the enemy crashes in the wall. You see? So, what happens here? The target country obviously does something wrong. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy, conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything. Right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited. Right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, Right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis. Right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? So. On the stage of demoralization, obviously, there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly <clears throat> in case of religion? Destroy it. Ridicule it. Replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, Anything, as long as it takes you away, okay? Uh, social life. Replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility 
from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals, and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Okay, away from the natural links, power structure. Okay, the natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, face, they, they, they have so much power, almost monopolistic power on your mind? They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, president and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew, who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalists. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you're better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army looks Dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug, but basically he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. You know? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. Relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> a nice fellow. <power>. Erosion. <laughs> a slow substitution of basic moral principles, whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the 
traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me, and you give me your five pairs of shoes, and I will distribute it accordingly. So the, the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death, death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer. Now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving of wor uh, a workers' condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets. Murders, shooting truck drivers by picketers. In Montreal, for example, I saw with my own eyes when I was correspondent of CBC International, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when the workers of aircraft factory destroyed computers and, and, and the equipment in the factory. And they, the, the administration employed strike breakers. Their cars were turned upside down and burned. Their houses were burned, their kids were intimidated, and some victims were there. Of that you can be sure. Why? To improve conditions of worker? No. Ideology. Okay, so this is what happens, basically. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union. But the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers' right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. Whose rights? Workers? No. The, the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? By trade union boss. Unlimited power is given, responsibility. I want to sell my labor not for two fifty an hour, but for two dollars. I don't have right. My freedom is denied to me. I know that if I sell my work for two for two dollars an hour, not for three dollars an hour, I will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy. I don't need two three dollars. I need only two dollars. No, I was made to believe by media, by business by advertising agencies that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. No way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, 
you have to buy it and hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, you hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a pantyhose sale. <laughs> save by buying more. <laughs> of course, of course. It, it would be too naive to expect that KGB makes that advertising agency to, to do such a crazy commercial. No, of course not. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious groups with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninism propaganda. Then a propaganda of of the legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality, equality, mind you. President Kennedy once said, people, we will make America to believe that people are born equal. Are people born equal? Is there any mentioning in the Bible or any other holy scripture in any religion, any religion, if you don't believe me, go to the library and check it. There is not a single word about equality. Just the opposite. By your deeds, God will judge you. What you do is important. The merit of your personality. You cannot legislate equality if you want to be equal. You have to be equal. You have to deserve it. And yet we build our society on the principle of equality. We say people are equal. We know it is false. It's a lie. Some people are tall and stupid. Others are short, bold, and clever. <laughs> if we make them... If we make them equal by force... <laughs> If we put the principle of equality in the basis of our social political structure, it's the same thing as building a house on sand. Sooner or later it will collapse, and that's exactly what happens. And we, as Soviet propaganda makers, are trying to push you in the direction which you go yourself. Equality, yes, equality. People are equal. Land of equal opportunities. Is it true or not? Think about it. Equal opportunities. Should there be equal opportunities? For me and for a lazy bastard who comes here from some other country and immediately registers as, as a welfare uh, recipient benefit. I never received a single dot. No, sorry, I did receive once. But I never applied for welfare. For the 13 years, I took any job. Security guard, journalist taxi driver, anything. Well, I was restless, but some people don't like it. They immediately... So why should we be... Why should we have equal opportunities? Do you think it's fair if myself and my wife from Philippines who work like a... excuse me, horse, uh, as a lab technician in, in the hospital, should have the same rights as a criminal from, from Cuba? Why? And yet we repeat as parrots, equality, equality, equality. And the Soviet propaganda system helps us to believe that equality is something which is desirable. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union, quote unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt, except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure if it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, but there's no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia, and we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of 
quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism. That is my former colleagues from Novosti Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send a, a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges. No. You let them. from Novosti Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send a, a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges, no. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions of the, of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable. There is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, Mr. Come, you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order, plus military. And uh, economy, law and order, Yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different, I I'll explain later. Okay, basically, three areas. Economy. The radicalization of bar bargaining process. If on that stage, we still could achieve, theoretically, some positive compromise between the negotiating sides with, with uh, say, uh, the ar ar arbitrary, in introduction of arbitrary judges, uh, third side, uh, objectively judging the, the demands of both sides. Here, it's radicalization. On, this, on the stage of destabilization, we cannot come to compromise even within a family. The husband and wife couldn't figure out which is better. Husband wants his kids to eat at the table, and wife wants him, a uh, child, to roam around the room and and drop food all over the floor. They cannot come to compromise unless they start a fight. It's impossible to reach a compromise, constructive compromise, between neighbors. Some people say, I don't like you to work during your loan at that time because exactly at that time I'm walking my dog and he's getting nervous. And he cannot uh, pass his bowels, you know. So They cannot compromise. They go to a, a, a civil court or something like that. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges. Fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere between laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. Unlike Japanese, with the theory Z, if you, if you ever heard about it, where the workers are involved in decision-making process, therefore they don't have uh, moral incentive to, to fight their, uh, their bosses. In the United States, it's just the opposite. The harder is the, the fight, the better. The more heroic they look. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States 
were approaching these strikers and they say, oh yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family, uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in the protest against the uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people, you see? The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry, say, why, why, why so much hatred? Today we are not. We say, well, it's commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. Shooting people. Okay, law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals, and the society at large. The media puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large. Separate, alienated. Okay? On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is the object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently they act. In, they actively include themselves in a political process. All of a sudden we see a homosexual. Fifteen years ago he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. It's a, a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and Hiral is a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group, and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is destabilization process. The sleepers many of whom are simply KGB agents, become leaders of the process of destabilization. Doesn't mean that Comrade Andropov sends Comrade Ivanov to the United States. The person who takes care is already here. He is a respected citizen of the United States. Sometimes he, he gets money from various foundations for, for his legitimate uh, struggle for I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. There are sympathetic Americans who donate their money to him. This stabilization process usually leads directly to the process of crisis. In case of developing nations, that's the area where I, I was active, the process starts When, when the legitimate bodies of power, the social structure collapse, it's, it cannot function anymore. So instead, we have artificial body injected into society, such as non-elected committees. You remember I was talking about them here. Social workers who are not elected by people, media who, sel who are self-appointed rulers of your opinion, uh, some strange groups uh, which claim that they know how to lead society forward. They don't usually. All they care is how to collect donations and, 
and, prom and sell their own concocted ideology, mixture of religion and ideology. Here, we have all this artificial body claiming power. If the power is denied to them, they take it by force. In case of Iran, for example, all of a sudden we have revolutionary committees. Who? What, what kind of revolution? There was no revolution yet, and yet they had the committees. They were taking power of, of judgment. They had, they had the power of execution, they had the power of, of uh, le legislation, and that they had the power of, of uh, judicial. Uh, all of them combined in one person, who is half-baked intellectual, sometimes graduated from Harvard University or, or Berkeley. He comes back to his country and, and he, he thinks that he, he knows the answer to all the social economical problems. Okay? Crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously. That's the, the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized. When, when somebody put, put the employers on their place and, and let us work, we are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader, a savior is needed. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are, we have a savior. Either a foreign nation comes in, or the local group of, of leftists, Marxists, no matter what they call themselves, Sandinista, a reverend or some sort, Bishop Muzureva, like in, in Zimbabwe, doesn't matter. A savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war. An invasion. Okay? See how it goes? Civil war, we know what it is. Lebanon is, is the best example. The civil war, which was artificially implanted in Lebanon by injection of force of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Invasion we have in many other countries like Afghanistan, uh, name any East European country, it, it was invaded by the Soviet army. But the result is the same. The next stage is normalization. Normalization is a very ironic word, of course. It is borrowed from 1968 situation in Czechoslovakia, when the Soviet propaganda and after them New York Times declared the country is normalized. The tanks moved into Prague, so there's no more Prague Spring, there's no more violence, normal, normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and homosexuals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. You remember Bangladesh? This is the crisis in which I was instrumental. First they had Mujibur Rahman. In 1971 he was the leader of, of People's Party, Awami League, with moustache like Stalin. He was in, in, in Russia many times. In five years he was shot by his former colleagues, Marxists. He fulfilled his function. In Afghanistan, it happened three times. First there was Taraki, then there was Amin, now there's Babrak Karmal. They killed each other successively, one after another. The moment he fulfills his duty, the first one demoralized country, the second destabilized, the third one brought it to crisis. 
Goodbye, comrades. <laughs> Babrak Karmal comes from Moscow and put him in, into the seat of power. Same thing happened in Grenada recently. Maurice Bishop, Marxist, was killed by Austin, what's his name, General something, who was also a Marxist. Right? So no more revolutions, please. Normalization now. From now on, no more strikes, no more homosexuals, no more women lead, no more kid lead, no more lead, period. <laughs> A good, solid, democratic, proletarian freedom. <laughs> now, to reverse this process takes enormous effort. When today, the United States had to invade Grenada to reverse the process of subversion. Some people say, boy, this is not good, it's not kosher to invade the beautiful country, island of Grenada. <laughs> well, why didn't you stop the process here, when Grenada was just approached by leftists? Why not to prevent Maurice Bishop to come in power in the first place? Did Grenadians want him? Very questionable. They didn't know who was Maurice Bishop.